I found that children would begin to answer questions way, way, way ahead of their time. I gave you many, many examples, you know, years and years ahead of their time. And I also discovered that if you admire them, if you admire the process, you say, my God, fantastic, how did you do that? They feel very happy and the process becomes even more efficient. Remember, collective desire instead of management. The opposite of discipline. So he gave it a name. I called it the method of the grandmother. If you think of your grandparents, they use learning methods which are very different from either your parents or your teachers. Parents and teachers depend on discipline. You must do your homework. You know, you're not spending enough time studying. What will happen to you when you grow up if you don't study well now? This is the mother-teacher uh, method. The grandmother or the grandfather on the other hand might say, you know, when I was your age, I was really stupid. I couldn't do anything. And the child would say, you can't even do this. And she'll do something more. They use admiration to develop a learning spiral. Could we use that in a self-organized learning environment? Well, I made an appeal in the Guardian newspaper uh, saying, if you're a grandparent, if you have access to the internet and a web camera, will you give me one hour of your time every week for free? In two weeks, I got 200. Now we have about 600, I think. I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this room. <laughs> so, they, they have a name. They're called the Granny Cloud. So the Granny Cloud sits up there on the internet, and I finally solved my problem with the slum, about the places where good teachers cannot go or don't want to go. I can beam the, gra the Granny Cloud over Skype <coughs> into those places. What do they do there? Well, the instructions are, do not teach. You know, all, all through this period that I've been talking, did you notice that uh, I didn't actually use the word teach at all? We used the word learn, but we didn't use the word teach. So the granny cloud is told, do not teach. Just have a conversation. Lots of things will happen because of the conversation. To give you an example of a recent uh, event, uh, a recent session that I heard about, uh, the, the, the cloud granny, as they're called, she had prepared a story that she wanted to read to the children. So she said, you know, I prepared so much. I prepared, hello children. She's, uh, you know, Skyping into India. Hello children, would you like to listen to a lovely story? And the children said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, oh, <laughs> well, would you like to tell me a story then? And the children said, no. <laughs> so she said, well, well, in that case, what are we going to do? And the children said, what do you have in your fridge? <laughs> so she said, well, you know, lots of things. So they said, yeah, why don't you take your laptop, go to the fridge, open the door, and explain to us everything there is inside it. <laughs> and she said, I spent the entire afternoon discussing supermarkets. <laughs> but I thought it was a brilliant conversation. Cross-cultural, uh, you know, uh, what I've noticed is that the children understand the other side a lot better, their abilities to communicate across cultures improve, uh, and of course, the way in which they speak in English also improves. Uh, just to uh, give you an example of the early days of the Granny Cloud. You can't catch me. I didn't show you what happened to the rest of it. I was filming it. Uh, this was between uh, Newcastle and uh, Hyderabad. Um, uh, and, and it was filmed at both ends. Uh, but if I showed you the clip on the other end, after this poem was over and everything, then the children were turning to each other and saying, what gingerbread kya hota hai? And so on and so forth. Uh, so anyway, um, back in uh, 2013, I won a prize. It's called the TED Prize. And uh, the prize, the way it works is that they, they give you a lot of money, a million dollars, but uh, they, tell you, they ask you 
what would you like to do with it? So I designed an experiment. The experiment would be, the experiment was to build seven facilities, five in India and two in England, where we would bring two concepts together. The concept of the self-organized learning environment and the concept of the granny cloud. And we would put the two together and call it the school in the cloud. The five in India range all the way from really disadvantaged areas. The, the most remote area I have is in the Sundarbans Delta, you know, where the Ganges meets the Bay of Bengal. Uh, it's, it's really wild. There's no electricity, there's no healthcare, there's barely any schooling. From there into slightly more urban, finally semi-urban in Maharashtra, quite close to here, and then two urban middle-class British schools. Uh, near Newcastle. And the idea was, over a three-year period, to see what changes would happen, if any, to the children. <coughs> Here's a look at some of them. This is a village called Chandrakona in Bengal. Uh, that's what the structure looks like. This is what it looks like from the inside. Nothing very special. I mean, this is, you know, six or seven big screen computers. You know why the screen should be big. Uh, lots of children, that's about it. Uh, one missing detail, there's no teacher. Harlem, New York. This is the cheapest design I have. It's built at floor level and uh, it's really beautiful. And Harlem is a you know, very troubled part of New York. There's a lot of crime and drugs and things. Well, they used to be, it's getting better now. But uh, the children have really, really benefited uh, from the soul. Uh, this is the one in, in, the, in, uh, in the village Newton Eycliffe in County Durham in England. This is among the last ones that I built, the most recent ones. It's in a village in Bengal again called Daskara. It's the smallest one I've built. It's just 15 feet by 15 feet and can hold about uh, 16 or so children at a time. Uh, it's completely glass. So standing anywhere on the road or inside the school, you can see everything happening, what's happening inside. And uh, the good news is that the, the most recent one, uh, a real school that uh, depends heavily on the soul is right here in your city. It's called Paradise School and it's, uh, you know, So if you watch Star Trek, it looks a bit like that, doesn't it? So, um, uh, and it is in a way uh, like a spaceship, not just this school but any soul. But if you look at learning as a journey, going from one place to the other, remember the ants taking their food pieces from one place to the other? It is, if it is about going from one point to the other, then the school in the cloud is that vehicle in which uh, the learner can go. So what does the data say? Well, I haven't gone through all of it yet. I'm still going through it. But there are some things that I can say now very, very clearly. There is a rapid increase in reading comprehension. To be expected, not surprising. Because the internet doesn't know that they are children on the other side. So the internet throws everything it has at them. The children don't know what they're supposed to be able to read and understand and what they're not supposed to be able to read and understand. So they read everything. So you get nine-year-olds from a slum in Hyderabad quoting, for example, uh, the Harvard Business Review. They should not, according to all of us here, but they do and they can. It's just that we don't let them. Do they make sense out of it? Yes, they do. There's a small piece of research that uh, is going on right now that I'm doing and which you can try for yourself. You know, traditionally in education we believe that a child of a certain age can read material of a certain level. And people call it all sorts of names. They call it key stages and all sorts of things. 
If you take a group of children, the situation is different. You know, reading is not considered a group activity, mainly because of the form factor of the book. It's because of technology. A book can only be read by one person at a time. But on a big screen, lots of people can read the same text. If you do that, and if you try it with children, and I think I've been one of the first people to have tried this, I get this very strange result. Children reading together in the presence of the internet off a big screen can make sense out of material which is literally decades ahead of their time. Okay, try it if you want. Take some 12 or 13 year olds, give them a poem in Sanskrit and give them 40 minutes, give them a couple of internet connections. They'll tell you what it says. It's a different world. Their communication skills go up because when you ask them these really difficult questions and they have to finally come back with an answer, they need to be able to communicate that answer, right? So to, to, if they're answering a question 10 years ahead of their time, they also need to use the language to, to explain it uh, to you. If you do that repeatedly, their communication skills go up. Their ability to search on the internet obviously goes up because you know they're doing that all the time and they're doing it with complex issues. They begin to understand how to detect a wrong website from a right website. They begin to understand how to resolve a difference of opinion between websites all by themselves. This is not taught in school. I, I don't understand this. Have, do you understand or do you agree that being able to search accurately on the internet is a key life skill for the 21st century and it's not taught in school. We expect our children to learn it in the street. <coughs> I don't know why, but the soul can reverse that. And finally, all of that changes their self-confidence. If you try it, you'll see it in your children. They'll also do this to you. <laughs> so that's the end of the good news, by the way. Here comes the bad news. This. Okay, at the end of schooling in most countries around the world, there is a great big exam. During the exam, you have to sit alone. You cannot look to your left, you cannot look to your right. You cannot talk to your neighbor, you cannot look at another person's work. You cannot use any assistive technology. Then you ask the question and you have to answer from your head. That's called knowing. Where did it come from, you know, this idea of the exam? I started looking it up and uh, it's very easy to find out where it came from. I'll show you, I'll show you a picture of an office in 1920. That's what it used to look like, okay? Rows and rows of clerks and a floor supervisor walking up and down. What do the clerks need to know? They need to know how to read and understand an instruction. They need to know how to have clear handwriting so that one person's handwriting can be read by another person. And they need to know how to do arithmetic in their head because there are no devices at that time. They must never question an instruction. You know, I mean, you give a clerk an instruction, say, copy column number two from ledger number one into ledger number three. You don't expect the clerk to say, why should I do that? <laughs> He's not allowed to question an instruction. And under no circumstances should a clerk be creative. You know, a creative clerk is a dangerous thing, let me tell you. <laughs> so you need a system. The world used to run, used to need millions of people like that to run, to run human civilization. From Vancouver to Wellington, millions of them. Where do we produce these people from? The people who will not look left, not look right, write with neat handwriting, read and understand, do arithmetic in their head. A system was built, a great machine to produce millions of these identical clubs. It's called school. <laughs> So, 
So you can you can see the connection very very easily. Let me let me show you these two pictures. You see that and this, that and this. So do you see who we are preparing our children for? For people who died more than a hundred years ago. Okay. And in order to cater to that obsolete system, us teachers have to follow the model of education of the 19th century, which is rote memorization, negative reinforcement, etc., etc. So if there are students sitting at the back, don't get annoyed if your teacher says, you know, be quiet, you know, sit down, and so on and so forth. They're preparing you, remember, for 1920. <laughs> so teachers, good and bad, we have to follow that method. What can we do? Children today are going to grow up for this world. This is the kind of place most of, most of your, our children, or those of you who are children, most of you will be working in places like this. Doesn't it remind you a bit about the hole in the wall? You know, the discussion group, unsupervised access to the internet. So if you have to prepare children for a world like that, shouldn't the examination system look like this? <laughs> so after all these years, if I had to, if you had to say, what is the conclusion? What is the one important conclusion that you want to tell us? Well, this is it. <laughs> if we use, if we use the internet 24 by 7, if we can't live without it, if it's sitting inside our pockets with everyone, why should the examination be the only day in your life when you don't have the internet? <laughs> What does that mean? You know what it is like? It's like asking someone to tell the time without looking at their watch. Even if you know how to do that, is it any of, it, of any use? Okay, I'm about to, to close now. Um, so, use the internet during the exam. I think the subject areas, we need to redefine three of them. Comprehension, communication, and computing. Comprehension will subsume reading. Because reading is not the only way we comprehend things anymore. We comprehend things from all sorts of different ways. So reading as a special case of comprehension. Writing as a special case of communication. Writing is not the only way that we communicate these days. There are a hundred different ways to communicate. And as far as uh, handwriting is concerned, I think it should be made into a hobby, like knitting. <laughs> okay? I mean, who's going to write by hand anyway? Even I, I'm from that old generation, even I, if I have to write an A4 size piece of paper by hand today, my fingers start paining. So, let's not do that anymore. Um, and finally, arithmetic should be subsumed into this area called computing. I don't mean computer programming, I mean computing. The ability to compute the answer to a question. My best example is, in England, to a group of 10-year-olds, a maths teacher and I had given them a simultaneous equation. They didn't know any algebra. So they said, what's that? Why are all the letters and numbers mixed up together? So I said, I don't know. You need to tell me. What's the solution to that equation? What does the solution mean? I don't know. It just says, what's the solution? We left them alone with the internet. I thought that they would solve it. But actually, after 20 minutes, they hadn't solved it. Instead, they said, can we have some graph paper, a pencil, and a ruler? So I said, what for? Did the internet tell you that? And they said, no. You know what you've written over there? They are two straight lines. And what you're asking us to do is to find out where the two lines intersect. So we're going to do it with graph paper. You tell me, isn't that a better understanding of simultaneous equation than what's taught in school? So that's what should be happening to the subjects. Comprehension, communication, computing. What are schools for? 
But how, how do you like this as a definition? School should enable people to live happy, healthy, and productive lives. Whatever productive might mean in our time. So if that means creativity, if that means whatever. Problem solving. Happy, healthy, productive. So I can make a matrix. Happy, healthy, productive on one side. Comprehension, communication, computing on the other. If you're doing anything in your school, it should fit somewhere into that matrix. Let's take an example. Dancing. Does it make you happy? Yes, it does. Does it make you healthy? Yes, it does. Does it make you productive? Yes, you learn about rhythm and form and a different way of communicating. It fits comprehension, communication, happy, healthy, productive. It should be there in every school. Now let's take the 17 times tables. Does it make you happy? Does it make you healthy? It gives you a headache. Does it make you productive? Yes, it did in 1920. <laughs> so, should we have it in school? I'm afraid not. What I'm working on now are these. First of all, curriculum. What should we do with curriculum? So you know something funny about curriculum? What is curriculum? Curriculum is everything that we know, isn't it? So it's a geography curriculum. So that means everything we know about geography. So if that is how a curriculum is defined, then is it not true that with time, every curriculum will get bigger and bigger and bigger as more things are found out? And you'll find many teachers complaining about this and say, how much can I teach in a semester? Every year they keep increasing it. It's because the curriculum is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not a tenable way to do curriculum. But suppose we did something different. Suppose we took an area and we wrote down the big things in that area that nobody knows anything about. The big questions. That list should get smaller with time, isn't it? The things we don't know. Think of the list of things we don't know back when the pyramids were being built versus the list of things that we don't know today. Well, there are certain new areas that have come up, but in the old areas that the Egyptians didn't know, many of the things are now known. So that list gets smaller, whereas the other list gets bigger. Is it possible to reframe curriculum as a series of big things that the human race still does not know? And if you think about it, if I tell you that there's something that we really don't understand, almost everybody on this planet is interested, particularly children. As opposed to saying, I'll tell you about what uh, I have learned in the last 50 years. That's curriculum. The pedagogy, well, we talked about it a lot. The internet must figure in how something is learned. And I think I've found one of the ways in which learning becomes more efficient with the use of the internet and groups. And finally, assessment. What should the exam look like? We know that the way it is right now is, is no good. It, well, I won't say it's no good. It did its job for the last 300 years. We don't need it anymore. It's obsolete. What should we replace it with? Well, I don't quite know yet. But if you call me back next year, maybe I'll tell you. <laughs> and somewhere in all of this, I think, lies the future of learning. Thank you very much.